Five, four, three, two, one. Please do not change channel. From Krypton Radio, brought to you by Famous Faces and Funnies and Off the Chain with Yvonne Mason, it's the Hanging with Web Show Radio Hour, the Internet's premier pop culture talk radio show. You're tuned in, you're logged on, and now your host, G.W. Pometer and Christian Basil. Who are you hanging with? Hello, Krypton Radio and all World Wide Web. You're listening to the Hanging with Web Show Radio Hour. I'm G.W. Pometer. And I'm Christian Basil, everybody on the World Wide Web and iHeartRadio. How are you guys doing? Welcome. Welcome back. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Welcome all to the right. show. right. Yes. Uh, on the line with us tonight, we have author and entrepreneur. I love that word. I made it up. That's a good word. It's entrepreneur. Entrepreneur? And yes. Art, art, entrepreneur. So, <laughs> yes. Entrepreneur. Like Jamie Art-trip-a-nur. Engel is on the line with us. Jamie, how are you tonight? I am doing great, manure free. Thank you for asking. Oh, That's important. It is. No crap. <laughs> it is. Um, tonight's topic. Uh, we're gonna. Get, we'll, we'll, we'll just. We'll, we'll tease it just a little bit before we get into some of the news coming up. Tonight's topic is from pages to pictures, journeys from literature into film, and particularly, obviously, for our audience here on Krypton Radio and iHeartRadio and the folks that watch the Hanging with Web Show, we want to talk about sci-fi, pop culture, fantasy properties uh, mostly, but this has been a long-standing tradition of bringing, from the earliest days of making movies, they Uh delved into literature for content. So I think it should be a really, really fun topic. Um, Before we do that, instead of doing the news tonight, though, with this topic in mind... Uh, we have a uh, little clickbait, little clickbait. We have okay. t- l- 10 books you, you have to read before their movies come out or before you see their movies in 2018 because it's coming right now in 2018. So here's the Hanging With Web Show's very own Sage Ia with our top 10. Yes. Now, these are, these are books you should read before you see the movie. I will, I will start us out with some that have just recently come out. Um, a Wrinkle in they're, Time. They're not all Madeline Cliff Notes Langle. to the movies, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're all the Cliff Notes. <laughs> so this is A Wrinkle in Time. A Wrinkle Sorry, in Time. Sorry, go it ahead. Stars... I, that just gets. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> it stars um, Reese Witherspoon, <laughs> Oprah Winfrey, and Chris Pine, who we all love in our sci-fi world. But that came out March 9th, and that was based on a book. Wrinkle in time. I would hope so. Yes, that's what you were. That's what we're uh, doing. Yes, because you had to read the book, so it had there has to be a book. That's exactly right. Wow. Well, some some of it's the all right, movie Jamie, titles Christian, are not Christian, Sage will catch up book. with us. She'll be here in a minute. Look, some of the movie titles are not the name of their book. Okay, so we believe you. Just letting you know. It, we, we have no way to know unless you show us your list. So tell us more. Okay, I have uh, another movie that has recently come out, and that was Ready Player One, which was originally uh, written by Ernest Klein. <laughs> Okay. So good. And did you Are see you, it? Have you seen the movie yet, Jamie? Oh, it was, it was amazing. I absolutely loved it. This is what I hear awesome. from everybody. I heard so much early, like pre-people saying, oh, my God, I, I don't know if I want to see this. I'm afraid. And then every single person who said, I don't know if I want to see it, came out of the theater and went, oh, my God, that was so amazing. Well, you know, Spielberg, it's Spielberg amazing. picked that up. And, mm-hmm. uh, That's it. Yeah, it's a dystopian that takes place the retro sci-fi. It takes place retro in 2044. Sci-fi. Yeah, retro sci-fi. 2044. In the 80s. In the 80s. Yes. So big hair, lots of leather, some studs, like Michael Jackson's jacket kind of thing. Awesome, oh, that's the 1980s. <laughs> nice, nice. Okay, what else, what, what else you got for us? We can have, pick this, apart. This is the last one that has already come out that you should read first, and it's Red Sparrow. Red, which, that one I don't know. That was written by Jason Matthews. It stars Jennifer Lawrence, our uh-huh. girl from Hunger Games. Hunger Games, yes. Yep, and Jeremy Irons, and that came out on March second. But that Jeremy was, Irons from everything. Yes, but that was a book first, <laughs> and, and you should you should read that too. Everything, yeah. Yeah, everything. And Jer- Jeremy Irons. I like, did not oh. know that. Uh, the movie looks great, but I didn't know it was a book. Yeah. Let's see, Isn't look that at cool? that. Look at that. We learn hmm. something new every day on the Hangout did with the, the Web Show. Did the movie do well? I, I mean, I Thanks for having me, guys. Then... Bye. I said, boom. We have given Jamie all she needs tonight. She's now got to go find a book. Uh, okay, so what do you got? What do you, what else got? What do you got? Well, speaking of dystopians, there's yes. another one. Um, it was written by Alexandra Bracken. It's called The Darkest Minds. The Darkest Minds. The Darkest Minds. It's a dystopian. Again, uh-huh. um, there's a teenager who survives a mysterious disease and ends up with superpowers. Because, yeah. Why can't I get that? I get, yes. like, the flu. 
better than yeah, a zombie. Yeah, exactly. I get like you know, I get like you know, whooping cough. This guy gets like superpowers. Yes. I know. Mandy Moore is Messed going to do that, and so is Gwendolyn Christie from Game of Thrones and, and Star Wars. For all of us who love the her, the world's tallest woman. The world's tallest woman. Yes, that'll come out September fourteenth. The darkest minds. <laughs> cool. Mm-hmm. That that is. It does sound cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I also have the first man. Uh, this is an autobiography by Neil Armstrong. Oh. So the first man will come out October 12th in 2018, and it's going to follow his, his life and all about going to the moon. Okay. Guess, wait, guess who's playing Neil Armstrong? Ryan Gosling. Bruce Willis. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Gosling. And, and he, yeah, okay, so. Did they, did they oh, actually, that's kind of interesting. It is. It's, it? it's interesting casting. Um, okay, so I just want to say, this is a man who, I mean, Neil Armstrong, he was an astronaut, educated, you know, man. But he had an entire life, a long life. Yes. And, and we only ever remember one thing that he said. He wrote a whole book on that. Oh, well, then I'm that's, just saying, the whole world knows he said about. one <laughs> sentence. If you say one in great sentence your whole life, the rest is forgotten about. That's why he wrote the book. True. So that they could remember that there were more sentences. <laughs> so so they they could could lots of great sentences. sentences. And then they put into a movie. Yeah. <laughs> Make it sound like a date. Those of us who don't want to read. Said, the rest of it didn't matter to me. That's <laughs> mm-hmm. Maybe the book blank... is just that one sentence over and over and over again. That would be. I was going to say 140 <laughs> blank pages, and right in the middle it says "one small step for man." That's Turn one the small page, step for man. One giant leap for mankind. One and... giant bill for the le- for the dinner tab. That's right. That's right. It, <laughs> the bill for Neil Armstrong's one step was almost as much as it has been for the U.S. government to keep rescuing Matt Damon. <laughs> no. <this> is... <laughs> wow. Oh. I mean, Holy look, man. we've rescued him. All right, from... number seven. <laughs> 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 Boy, I wish I could really follow up with that. We'll, we'll never get through this list ever. Oh, no, that's wow. okay. Well, I have one. It's called The House with a Clock in Its Walls. The, okay. oh, that looks really good. Yes. It was, I have not seen anything on this. Uh, Jamie, okay. just, is there a teaser? Is there, no, I, you got, you got a, I something can, for us? I can us? tell you. John Belair's, uh wrote this book. It's about an orphan who lives with his uncle, and he discovers that magic is real and that he can do magic. But he, he raises mm-hmm. a woman from the dead. Which is not a good thing. That's not a good place to start. She is out to destroy mankind, and so he has to find the clock, which is the only thing that can stop her. Okay, so awesome. He, he finds out he's magic, and the very first thing he does is necromancy. Well, I don't know if it's the very first thing, but yes. You can't start with card tricks? Apparently not. Nothing. No rabbits either. No, no rabbits no. out of head. Raise the dead. Yes. Jamie, if you found out you had Listen. magic, what was the first thing you would do? I would make my room clean and my house spotless forever. Because that's what I spend most of my time doing is cleaning. It, uh, amen to that. Just mm-hmm. pop, snap my like Mary Poppins, boom. After no. that, after that, then I would grow really tall so people would then refer to me as the tallest woman in the world. And then she could take on Gwendolyn Christie in a sword fight? Correct. Instead Correct. of a hound. It'll be Jamie versus Gwendolyn. I can see Ryan Gosling from here. <laughs> uh, we mentioned Jamie would snap her fingers like Mary Poppins and clean her house, and you, your face lit up over there. So That's what is exactly that about? exactly right, because Mary Poppins, which was written by P.L. Travers, um, is coming back to the screen. Um, Disney is putting that out December the 25th, 2018. Now, Emily, this isn't a remake. This is a sequel. This is a no. sequel. Correct. Emily Blunt is, is going to be yes. starring in it. She is going to be doing that. And Meryl Streep. Is going to be in it, Colin Firth. Yes. So wow, it's, it's so should good. be really that should be, be pretty something. intense. Christmas Day of this year. And speaking of which, we were talking earlier about you know authors who hated their movies, and P.L. Travers is, is number two on the list. Yes, despised Mary Poppins. She was not. She was not happy with what Disney did to her book. Wow. Um, so, did you see the movie that was her going through the process of making her book with Tom Hanks as Disney as well? Yes. Yeah, finding, uh, finding uh, Mr. Saving, saving Mr. Banks. Yeah, saving, yes. Mr. Banks. saving Mr. Banks. Yes. Yeah, well, that, was, that was a phenomenal movie. A movie about making a movie that the author didn't want made. Mm-hmm. And it was an amazing movie. It really mm-hmm. was. Because Tom Hanks was in it. And mm-hmm. I don't That's know correct. what they did. If they put Tom Hanks Disney. in a movie, then it like automatically becomes good. 
It, it does sometimes. Look, they told a movie about a pilot that crashed an airplane. We watched it. And it was good. See? I'm fire. <laughs> fire! <laughs> Yet never, by the way, never let the guy who spent three years on an island after an airplane crash fly your airplane. That's just a good tip. That's very good advice. It is. That's a good tip. See? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Very good. It's going to land in a river. Um, <laughs> okay, well, wow. okay. I, I, have one, I have one last one. You have one last one. I do. Okay. okay. Sure, we'll let you now, finish the list. Go this, ahead. This book is, is book one of a trilogy, okay, by uh-huh. Patrick Ness. It's called The Knife of Never Letting Go. But the movie is going to be called Chaos Walking. Chaos Walking. Chaos Walking. Now, that's not coming out until 2019. But you cheated. We said 2018. Cheat. It's not. The reason I brought it up is because it stars Tom Holland, who is our wonderful super, our, our Spider-Man, and Daisy Ridley. He was. No, no, no. Shh, 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 shh. He was. Don't tell him anything. Um, but, but listen to this. Are listen we to allowed this. to be sad now on the air? No, I haven't seen, I haven't seen Avengers, if that's what you're referring that's to. Right. Oh, no, that's no, 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 no. Okay, okay, no, no, no. No, no, Jamie hasn't so seen it. it. Forget I said anything. Just bring tissue. But, but listen to this. Are you I've heard lots of things, so we're good. <laughs> Go. <laughs> so in Industrial Chaos Walking, size, dust right? <laughs> you're going to need it. We'll let you finish if you want to. I know to. you Save are. We're chatting over here. What do you well, want? I don't know what, what, what Patrick Ness was thinking of. So Todd lives on the distant planet of New World, right? And he believes they that... They got deep oh, and original on that. He did. But they believe that um, there was a germ that was released that killed all of the women on the planet. All right. Okay? I'm not going there. But then it, it unleashed noise oh, on man. Cool. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. It all right, I'm going to I'm going to do I'm going to get myself in trouble. I'll go ahead and say it. They killed all the women and released the noise. noise. So it released noise. Out. But he he finds a patch of silence. You'll never guess who created that patch of silence. A woman. A woman. <laughs> yes. A woman. So very good, Mrs. Hudson Thank impersonation. You. Like a by the way. Nice, plot. Nicely done. Um, but those are those are books that you should read before they come out on the screen. Wow. If you haven't read them already, and that's just that's just like the top ten. It is. Yeah, it is. <coughs> so books Robin to movies. Look, so, then since like the earliest days of cinema, directors and producers have looked to literature for inspiration. Um, I was just doing a dive. I wanted to know. I wanted the answer to the answer. What was the first book to movie? It turns out, eighteen ninety seven, they did Dickens and Oliver Twist. 1897. Like on a, on a Nickelodeon? Like a, like a, yes. Yeah. So uh, I made that sound do, effect do up that everybody on, on the radio. That was, that was, that do was that me. Again. Yes, do that again. <laughs> See? Uh, I do two shows a night. Try the veal. Um, <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. And then 1899... Was and I did not know this because I, I'm we live in Florida, all of us here on the show tonight, and we're Disney, you know, neighbors. But the very first Cinderella adaptation was done in 1899. Cinderella on film, uh, from one of the uh, earlier short story books from the Brothers Grimm. Um, 1902, Jules Verne's Trip to the Moon. And then in 1910, we got our first good monster movie with Frankenstein. Frankenstein oh, yes. In Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. That's right. So this is like a, an old standing tradition. And outside of our venues, it includes, you know, massive, huge, um, uh, popular films, uh, Gone with the Wind uh, from Margaret Mitchell, Mario Puzo's Godfather series, obviously, uh, you know, so I mean, it's it's way outside, but in the science fiction fantasy community, um, I mean, we've just we we must just have amazing authors. We love to turn our books we into love movies. to turn our books into movies. And as a matter of fact, Jamie and I are waiting for our calls from Hollywood. Yes, because we, we should mm-hmm. we should be getting it any day now. Available, <laughs> available. That's right. We are yeah. ready. Any day now is good. We know, you know, a few. I want to, we got to give a shout out to some of our Hanging with Lib Show alumni, though, uh, and good friends of ours. We've got some, some of our HWWS uh, authors who have done that. Dan Wells, I'm not a serial killer. So Dan Wells uh, made his I'm not a serial killer, which starred Christopher Lloyd. Yes, it did. So he actually kind of went up the list. Um, we've got Keith Rommel's The Curse Man. Mm-hmm. Nice, Scott. And we've got J.D. Demers, The Hunt Chronicles, is is not been a film yet, but has just been put optioned uh, yes, for it. Optioned. So 
Um, so exciting. And I mean, for an author, that's a big deal. I mean, it always has been. We're in Florida again. We love our Florida authors. We love our Florida filmmakers. We love uh, this community. Um, and, and because we love our Florida authors, obviously, the godfather of us all down in the Keys, Ernest Hemingway, uh, who's uh, Old Man of the Sea. Was uh, was was made into a film with Spencer Tracy. Um, said, you know, that's the goal of the author is drive to the border of California, throw your book over the fence. When they throw you money back, just go home. It's a good day. Collect that money. So uh, maybe Jamie and I need to just take a drive. We'll start throwing books over the. I fence. think Jamie <laughs> should throw the dredge over the over the California fence. I'm, I'm all about it. I think we might have thrown it over the fence for her today. That's it. Might have done that. So, you know, peace out with that. We're done. Anyway. Uh, okay, guys. So I had I had put together some questions for us to just kind of hash out um, because I know we had that top ten list of things that you should see. Kind of, We got that, by the way, from our friends over at USA Today. Um, and then Sage uh, bastardized it slightly because she wanted to make it more cool. I tweaked it because I'm a tweaker. That went sideways fast. Um, so. Uh, no comment. Top okay, so first first question for our for our panel. Uh we'll we'll start with Jamie and then Christian and then we'll come back to the room again after Sage gets off the floor. She's like lost her stuff. She can't stop like literally. Have you ever had the giggles? She's got the giggles. Uh okay, so top three movies based on books for each of you. Jamie, how about you? Top three movies based on books. Ding ding ding. Jamie? Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. Yes. Yes. Princess Bride. Definitely. Ender's Game. And what was the other one? Ender's Game. Ender's Game. Yes. Orson. Yes. That, that made my list over here, too, Ender's Game. And uh, and so did... Uh, um, my name is Inigo Montoya. That's right. I'm looking Princess for Bride. the six-fingered man who killed my father, prepare to die. Prepare to die. Prepare to die. Uh, and, and, you know, that gave us so many pop culture references. Like, Hello. Hello in there. <laughs> we're closed. Yeah, we're, no, we're not that. closed. We're not closed here. We're just, it was a joke. <laughs> Anybody who just came into the show, we're not closed. But anyway, give, go back five minutes. You'll know what we're talking about. Uh, Christian, for you, top, ten, top three. Yeah, if I did 10, we'd be here all night. We couldn't even get Sage to the top 10 on a newspaper article. Uh, (laughs) Top three movies based on books, Christian. What do you think? I can never tell if they were the books were written before the movie or vice versa, but I would say I have to... I'm I'm actually stooping into the horror genre. So I would say Stephen King's The Shining. He's going to love this next bit then. He's gonna love it. Okay, what? Oh, you're gonna love this next week. Um, The yeah. Exorcist. The Exorcist. Oh. oh, creepy. And um, I I guess anything J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you yes. go. Because uh, obviously, The Hobbit was actually Peter Jackson's Hobbit was actually so much more dimensional than J.R.R. Tolkien's Hobbit because it was yeah. his Hobbit was written sort of as a one-off. Uh, as a part of it, and then Lord of the Rings he did as a more in-depth series. So to right. see what Peter Jackson did with The Hobbit to kind of match it up to that same level was really kind of cool. Um, and wasn't that based off of his son's book, too? Because like there were two books after The Hobbit that he incorporated in that um, um, yes. Tolkien's son wrote? Yes, they uh, they actually. I don't, I don't know what took, they're called, but I, I've heard that. Well, and they actually, it was a great way for them to tie the Hobbit. It was sixty years between the Hobbit and uh, and the Lord of the Rings. Oh wow! Um, in the in not not in the books being written, but in the timeline of Tolkien's world. Mm-hmm. And in that sixty years, there were things that happened that tied the two books together. So when Peter Jackson went back to tell the story of the Hobbit, instead of showing us the 60 years in between, he injected those elements into the Hobbit's you know, hero's journey so that we would see familiar faces from Lord of the Rings. So we got to That's see cool. Gimli's dad, uh, Gloin. Uh, and we mm-hmm. gave him a little more. He had a more active role in the film and in the book. And then, of course, we got to see there was a the, the side stories, the love story of the dwarf and the elf, and mm-hmm. the Legolas story, which helped to tie us into a character that we knew from Lord of the Rings because we got it 
you know, in reverse order. So that was that was a great that was right. great filmmaking. And I think Peter Jackson did something in that film uh, that's probably more important than making that film, and that is the fact that that he did it on such a grand scale and did it so well epic. gave us yeah. the modern film and television epic. The, without without Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, there's no Game of Thrones. Uh-huh. Right. I mean, it just it leapt That's in true. bound. I mean, and 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 the, the, again, speaking of film adaptations, and I'll do mine. My Game of Thrones is top of my list um, because Game of Thrones to me is a, a seminal moment that tells the popular world, not just us in the arts and entertainment community, but it tells pop culture, it tells the popular world that visual storytelling, filmmaking, television is legitimate storytelling. It takes us out of the universe that we grew up in of the boob tube and brings us into an era when literature is coming from our television filmmakers. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I watch it on a 100-inch screen, so it counts to me. So uh, You have two more. Yeah, uh, I have two more. I have to choose two more. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, best sci-fi on television right now. Probably just a personal opinion, but I'm going to go with it anyway. Uh, the Expanse. Oh, love, okay. love, 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 uh, love the expanse, and and it's this is actually two writers uh, who wrote this. It's the the pen name is actually James S A Quarry, but it's actually two writers that are co- that co write the series under that same pen name. And it's the first book was uh, Leviathan Wakes, and that was the entire first season of the show, the Sci Fi Channel original. And uh, I love this film. They put the science in science fiction. They really did. Mm, Very few gadgets show. and gizmos that aren't either real now or on the drawing board now. Um, but they really do. And it's, it's, it took – it is uh, one reviewer – I, I want I, – we'll, we'll just – like the news – I think it was the New York Times. One reviewer actually said, this is Game of Thrones in space. And he followed it up by saying, this is the show that Firefly fans have been waiting for. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, it's a good show. Yeah, it's a good show. Um, and then I think my third, uh, I'm going to have to go with, because it's my favorite science fiction novel of all times, is Frank Herbert's Dune. And um, I wasn't a huge fan, because I was young, I was like 14, so I wasn't a huge fan of the 1984 David Lynch film. Um, I had just read the book, and I didn't quite understand the transition from a an epic novel into a two-hour story format. And so the things that were lost in translation, I just couldn't enjoy. But in 2000, when the Science Sci-Fi Channel put out their adaptation in in a, sh- a miniseries format, short again, long long storytelling. I think that's what all the, my three have in common is they're all long format stories. Um, I they they encompass so much of the books, and they did it in a visually stunning way, even with the limited technology of the time. And of course. They did it by having Vittorio Storaro, who is the cinematographer from Apocalypse Now, um, his color palettes and his setting the tone for the film. He told a visual story in a visual way and took my favorite science fiction novel uh, and turned it into, I think, one of my favorite science fiction film projects. And so it was really good. I like that. And um, But... Um, we, I, I have my, my list of questions here for everybody. Um, I have the question, um, the hardest thing that an author, because from Jamie's perspective, um, can go through when they're seeing their book adapted. And I'm going to follow that up with a list that we have of, of authors who actually hated their adaptations of film. But Jamie, as an author, what do you think the most difficult thing to see um, as they're adapting your book might be? Um, Off the top of my head would be the character not matching what I envisioned when I created them. I think that would be really hard to get over if they cast someone that I hadn't cast. So uh, casting, it's a big thing. I mean, in our minds, I think a lot of us uh, who write, in our minds, we sort of cast the movie when we're writing. And mm-hmm. and then yeah, check out my Pinterest. It's all cast. Yeah, yeah. See, you've <laughs> you've you've cast it already. 
It's going to be an expensive film, everybody. Yep. Um, but, oh, yeah. And yeah. they're like, you have to go time travel because all these kids are grown up now. They won't fit. They won't even fit in there. They're like, no. Well, mm-hmm. you know what? If you have Ralph Maggio on the list at all, he hasn't aged a day in 57.9 thousand <laughs> years. I'm actually pretty sure. He's Ralph on Maggio, my teen hunk list. He's, yeah, he's <laughs> Ralph Maggio, I actually think, is actually King Tut under a different name. <laughs> I, you know, we, they just, oh my God, um, we, that's coined. That's coined. Yeah. We, 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 just dro- here, folks, on- <laughs> <laughs> we just watched Cobra Kai the other day at Christian's, at Christian's, uh, recommendation. And I looked and I thought with the exception of a suit and tie, really? The, the, it, the man has got Dick Clark beat. It's amazing. That is hilarious. It is. So it is amazing. He's got a slow roll. Uh, yeah. And so, um, Christian, what do you think? If you know, what do you think? Miss- authors might have the biggest <clears throat> trouble with, or, or creators. And you, you know, so many creators from the show and from interviews you've done. What do you think the hardest part of seeing their books adapted to film might be for them? Well, I I can actually t- uh, probably relate to because I've seen some of my plays go to stage. Oh, okay. And- yeah. And it's basically, um, it's basically what the director has in their mind and what you have in your mind. You've got to work cohesively on something, a direction you want to take a joke, a story, or an idea. And the director comes in and goes, okay, I want to counter it with this. Or I want to do this. And they go, no, 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 no. And I've actually butted heads with directors going in one or different directions. So, the, um, yeah, so it's actually... It, the. In the it's in the word adaptation. As they're adapting, you're not. As yeah, the, exactly. As I have a vision, and you're like, okay, <laughs> and I'm going to change that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, of act. the folks that we've talked about here in the um, in the in the thing, when we come back, we're going to talk about some of these same writers and authors. And their and the movies that they hated. And guess what? Several of our favorites made the list. So we're going to be right back. We're going to say uh, a few words about our partners and friends. Hi, I'm Cosplay Michael with the Hanging with Web Show, and you're listening to Krypton Radio. And remember, cosplay's for everyone. Famous Faces and Funnies in Melbourne, Florida is leading the way in pop culture fun. From comic books and graphic novels to Funko Pops and collector's items, Famous Faces and Funnies has it all. Rick Shea and the professional team at Famous Faces and Funnies are friendly and knowledgeable. Whether you're looking for toys, props, collector treasures, or a new comic book, Famous Faces and Funnies is your one-stop shop. To find Famous Faces and Funnies on Facebook and Twitter, just type at FFF Comics. In the summer of 1953, private investigator Will Lucky Marks was working as the in-house private eye for Arcane Pacific Pictures. Trapped inside the studio with the killer, Lucky must find the killer before time runs out. Lot 28. Own it today. Available iTunes and Amazon.com. All She's right, welcome back it. to the Hanging With Web Show Radio Hour. I'm G.W. Pomager. And I'm Christian Basil. Uh, I yeah, am we've been Ia. mischievous. And we're on the line with the one and only Miss... Hello, Donuts. See me, Engel, here. All right, all right. We have been talking so far about literature to film, from, from pages to pictures, everybody. I like pictures. <laughs> Oh no! You you almost said picture pages, and that's a little little sensitive right that's now. That's different. Oh, geez. It's a different show. That's Rob. That's, that's, that's we, 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 if we even say that, do we actually not? Do we have to, do we have to check the explicit button now? No. Sh- <laughs> what? No. Oh my gosh! No, I didn't even think about that. I was thinking of Rob. You said pages and pictures and <laughs> picture pages. Picture pages. Anyway, welcome to the to show. Picture pages. I hated time that marker going. Nobody remembers that. Whatever. I love that show. Silence. Dead silence. Jamie knows. She said, Jamie knows. She said, she's, 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 she knew. she's just backing <laughs> you up, girl. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. What, what, what are, what are right. we talking so about? So we, we, we did our top three, uh, some of our favorite films based on books and, and, and our feelings about the books as well. Um, but some of these 
made the list of of movies that uh, the writers hated. One, a first example, Christian said his favorite book to film, one of his top three, was The Shining. Stephen King's The Shining. Yeah. Um, so good. A wonderful movie, and and Kubrick is like it, a genius filmmaker. Stephen King hated it. Yeah. Uh, he called what? it a big. Stephen King said that's a big, beautiful Cadillac with no engine in it. Oh, that's so heartbreaking. It is, um, and I think. Christian was saying this. He touched on this uh, from the playwright point of view, and I guess I can see it because adaptation is just that. It's an interpretation of what you of what you put on paper. And, um, you know, as writers, we spend a lot of time messaging and determining what our message and what our story is about, as does, obviously, Stephen King, who is, you know, again, one of the godfathers of us all. And he... Uh, Stanley Kubrick's vision when he read the book, the message he got, the interpretation that he saw in the story was entirely different than Stephen wow. King intended. <laughs> so, totally wow. I've never heard that before. Yep, that was a Stephen King quote. A big, beautiful Cadillac with no engine in it. Wow. That's harsh, by the way. That's harsh. Other authors mm-hmm. include P.L. Travers, Mary Poppins. We know she absolutely hated the Disney version because she never saw Mary Poppins as a children's story. She saw it as a parenting allegory. Right. Um, and we, again, we learn a lot more about her feelings through, uh, again, another Disney movie, uh, Saving Mr. Banks with Tom Hanks. We, we learned about P.L. Travers and how she dealt with and what she, the, well, the story she was trying to tell with Mary Poppins that Disney Which was so did, beautiful. Disney didn't connect with. I thought it was beautiful too. Well, I thought it was hated too. Those cartoons. It was so, yes. It but was look, so beautiful. Who well, doesn't but off to like the side, Christian? If, if this, well, off to the side, if Disney made the movies that the Brothers Grimm actually wrote, you think the kids growing up would have had the same? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. There'd yeah. be there'd be Good less point. artists and more serial killers. Because those are hey, dark guys, spoilers, stories. The Little Mermaid actually dies at the end. Of yeah, yeah, the no, Hans Christian of the Hans was, Christian Zimmerman. Yeah, she, he, of, she, she wasn't. He, you know, yeah. she, she wasn't based on a. She wasn't a love story. That was his love gone awry. Yeah. When he wrote that, so that was that was uh, so. P. L. Travers is on the list. Anne Rice is on the list. Oh, Interview, Interview with the, the vampire, vampire was so good, and this speaks to Jamie's point: casting. Originally, when they told Anne Rice in an interview with the vampire that Tom Cruise was going to be Lestat, I think she almost had a heart attack. She said, "What?" She did. She actually, she she actually called them and she said, "I don't, I don't think this is right. I don't think this is right." She went there, and she did another uh, another uh, test. You know, the screening that the actors come in and the auditions, and and uh, then she fell in love with Tom Cruise's Lestat, and so she actually loved Interview with the Vampire, which is why she signed the rights to Queen of the Damned. And in her oh. words, uh, they what did they 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 butchered my my story. Yes. She was terribly oh. she was devastated. So much so that even on her Facebook page today, when they talk to her about film rights for her books, she uh, has a very bad taste in her mouth. Even though she did she did admit she did love Interview with the Vampire. She did learn watching Tom Cruise act um, you know, she. I think they said Tom Cruise is going to be Lestat, and I think her first thing was the guy from Top Gun. Right yeah, back then, he took and, pretty. He's going. He can't do it. He's yeah, yeah get ugly. he's not. He pulled it off though. He did. Wow. And but then Queen of the Dam came, and she, oh. her opinion of Hollywood doing films to from from books yeah. went downhill in a hurry. Well, on that same it, topic, it I have a, a I have a question job. for everybody else. Yeah. For Christian and, and Jamie and you, is there something that you have seen that you had read and you were like, oh, they brought this to the screen or to the TV. I so want to see that. And you were disappointed with how it turned out? The cat in the hat. That was just <laughs> god off. <laughs> and, and for agree. all of you on Krypton Radio, I'm going to come to Christian's defense and Sorry. say, that's literature, baby. Well, no, it's literature. That's Dr. Seuss. And I, 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 I kind of have to yeah. agree with that. I do too. And I Michael do too. Meyer is butchering the heck out of it. I just, yeah, I, I see. I think um, if you're going to do Dr. Seuss justice, then you have to accept immediately that Dr. Seuss's target audience is children, 
It's not to be funny for us. And yes, it's comedic sometimes, and adults laugh all the time, but that's not its purpose. Dr. Well, Seuss was written for children. The, yeah. They wanted to recreate the Grinch. That's what happened. And they came up with this and said, well, if the Grinch was this popular, the cat in the hat's definitely got to do it. And, you know, it was Mike Myers' interpretation of the cat. And I was just like, oh. The yeah. cartoons were good. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. But again, oh, mm-hmm. awesome. target, you're targeting. You're targeting the same audience as Dr. Seuss. And again, Jim Carrey, I think if you did that, you set your five-year-old down in front of a, a movie, not a Dr. Seuss movie, and you let them watch Jim Carrey work and you let them watch Mike Myers work and see which one they laugh at. They're going to laugh their butts mm-hmm. off for Jim Carrey. That's true. Because he's funny no matter how old you are. He's, he's that kind of funny. He's like Robin Williams funny. But Mike, he, but he had he had something in the movie that I think would be different. He had he appeased both audiences. Yes. Even if the kids didn't understand what he was saying, they were still laughing at his mannerisms, at his slapstick, at the his large you gestures. Know, as you know, the, as, as they say in theater, the jazz hands, really large right. and, gestures. Yeah. And he would then you know he would say the adult jokes to appease the adults to keep them happy, but he appeased the entire audience. For me, in the Cat in the Hat, that didn't. I, no, I don't because know I think Mike Myers makes teenagers and adults laugh. And he does. He's very funny. He makes teenagers and adults laugh. He doesn't make children I laugh. Have... Yes, Jamie. Sage, I have one. This is going to be completely weird, but I'm, you know, I'm sitting here trying to think of one that's bothered me because I know there's a bunch of movies that I've been like, what in the world were they thinking? Huh. And one that really just stuck in my head is... That when they redid that movie Noah, <laughs> based oh, off yes, of the Bible Noah. story, the first half was freaking awesome with like the weird, creepy demon people and and like the whole concept was awesome. But then when Noah turned into like Je- Jeffrey Dahmer, I didn't get it, and I just thought it was over the top, and I was not happy with the uh, interpretation. And there is again interpretation because the first half of that is a visual interpretation of something that no one's ever visualized. It's, we've always seen it either in text or whatever, but it harkens back to the original Hebrew stories of Noah, and it also mm-hmm. touches other literature like the Epic of Gilgamesh and other flood. Yes. It, it ties those things together in a really interesting and cool way, the classic yes. literary way. Once they get on the ark... Mm, I don't know what happened there. I don't know. I have never, I've never seen a variation of the flood story that was that dark on the boat. I'm going to kill this baby. Yeah. And, what What is that about? Yeah, and Hermione was great. Like Hermione rocked it. Like I loved her in it. But oh God, yeah. She just yes. And, and you know what? She, that is the the you know that that made our list of the so probably the top ten uh, lit, pieces of literature. Uh, made into film, and that was the entire Harry Potter collection. Uh, well cast. Yeah, I don't know how I forgot that one. Yeah, well cast, <laughs> well Perfection. written, well directed, uh, mm-hmm. and, and and a true collaboration between the author and the filmmakers. She, yeah. she got to work with them and bring it. And because you know, one of the hardest things, and because I'm next on the on the you know what, I don't think there was a particular uh, book to film that I didn't you know, really like, um, my complaint is always the amount that needs to be cut in, in deference to time because Mm -hmm. some of my favorite novels are 400 pages long. I know you can't do that in two hours, you know? And so I go in knowing that you can't meet my expectations and I just want you to do the best job you can and wow me with your film as a separate entity. But I'm reminded that part of that, uh, feeling is um, I don't think I had that feeling all my life. It was only a couple of years ago. I actually, we were talking about Game of Thrones. I actually saw an interview with George Martin. And George Martin uh, was asked if he had problems with the changes for the HBO Game of Thrones series that were made to his uh, Song of Ice and Fire series. And in response to that question, he asked a question of his own. And he always asks his audience this question. And he always says, the question he has for everybody is, how many children did Scarlett O'Hara have? Love that question. Love it. In the book, she has three. On film, she has one. George R. R. Martin's answer, she never existed. She has none. 
So it really depends on where you know Scarlett O'Hara from, how many children she had. So a movie is a movie and, and a book is a book. And as long as you accept those two factors, you can enjoy both and really enjoy both for their separate entities, separate tellings and separate interpretations of the same stories. Um, that opened my mind a little bit. The more I thought about that question, mm-hmm. the more I thought about that answer, it made me think more, which, you know, you go to the movies, you don't want to think that much. You want to be entertained. But it made me think more, and it, and it made me open my mind up a little bit to things that I might not have been open to before. My biggest challenge is, see, I was not a fan of superhero movies in my era as a child because – we didn't have the tech to do what we have today. So right. when I when I went, when I saw the everybody remember the seventies eighties version of uh, it was the eighties version of Captain America. Oh my god! We don't we don't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, now, I think there's one exception to that rule. I think we can almost all agree on it, only because we just love the actor so much, and that's the seventies version of Incredible Hulk. Lou Ferrigno oh, Rock. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm just, I mean, I'm Wonder just Woman was good too. Wonder Woman was yes, good because we yeah. all want to yeah. turn around and get our, our, you know, change our clothes. I, all about that. I would love to be. Well, able to I, do I that. did. I would do that in, in my in my neighborhood with my invisible did, jet and my jump rope, just twirling around. Still got to see your invisible jet, <laughs> Jamie. That's like, our magic I, power. I, I, if we could do magic, if we found out oh, we could do magic, yeah, yeah, it's still there. It's Instant clothes change. Parked yes. in Titusville. Hey, hey, going back <laughs> to what Parked you said Titusville. about um, it's up at the, the Titusville kids. Airport. The popular for mm-hmm. the filmmakers because they're all looking go, for the invisible jet. I've never seen going, it there. Going, <laughs> going back to what you said about the kids, now I'm thinking about like how soap operas had kids show up on Christmas, around the holidays and Christmas time and then all of a sudden as soon as January hits, all those kids have disappeared and are never seen again until Christmas again. They yeah, there's a serious <laughs> child abduction problem in the That's soap so opera true. universe. It's so, but yeah, <laughs> tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> Yes, yes, it is. No, that's they, so they, true. They, they did. It, uh, yes, Family they did. Matters. Family Matters. A, a child disappeared. Cosby Show. A child disappeared. Th- these are these are not good places to live, <laughs> or at least to be a kid. Yeah, and that you know like what? Good, never happens. That like they a good never book that needs noticed. To be written. This is the thing. In those shows, they never noticed that their kid's gone. There's never like a line of dialogue. Right. Hey, has anybody seen Little Jimmy? Not since the th- second season. You know. It doesn't happen. Um, okay, so uh, back to our topic. What we can get? We just yeah, he's still decomposing in the basement. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> okay, guys, let's put our let's put our, our our other hats on. Let's see if we can attack this from the other side of the question. Not as creative, not as writers, but from the from the point of view of the filmmaker that would come and approach us. What do we think? The mo- what do I think? What do you think, Jamie and, and Christian? Um, what would the most difficult part of making a film from a novel be for them, in addition to dealing with all of us? That's what do you right. think? What's that the hardest sense. part about taking a, 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 a book and turning it into a movie? I think, well, I, I guess it depends on the source, because uh, for movies like Shakespeare, you know, Romeo and Juliet... And and all the movie, and Hamlet and all that you don't have the original source guy there, so you don't know what his interpretation is. And yeah, no, Bill, God, don't bitch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we don't. We never know if we went back in time and we told Bill, "Hey, Bill, we're making a movie about uh, you know uh, uh, of Hamlet. What do you think?" And he goes, "I don't care." <laughs> yeah, yeah, you never know. Yeah. I wrote that in a weekend. You know, I was just, I just, uh, and I think it's. When a production, if you have a director who really cares about the source material, especially yeah. when it comes to like comic books and such like that, because we we see the best uh, the best production values is when they kind of ride or pay homage to the source material as close by, but they still have to make this movie, so they may not they may have to cut places, or they may have to edit things, or they may have to reduce time. Or somewhere a character development may have to leave because of the time attention span that the audience has to yeah. watching a movie. We are, we're going to have to cut this out, or you know, um, I think I mentioned this. Uh, one of my fears of 
what the Avengers was going to be, and I said, I don't think it's going to happen, but uh, here's a movie that really took it to the extreme, was Mortal Kombat Annihilation. It had all these characters. It had mention of characters that weren't even in the movie. They just mentioned them to throw them in there, but they never developed them. They gave them, like, maybe five minutes of airtime, and that was it. And it was just this cluster of mess instead of it is, having it, a good story. Ensemble. Ensemble pieces. It's yeah. easier to write an ensemble piece than it is to film an ensemble piece. Because we've got unlimited pages, unlimited words. We can develop every character fully and then have them interact. Um, exposition is a huge part of what we do on this side of the camera. But um, it's not. It, there's no time for that kind of exposition on film. So th- that, is, that, that is a tough part. Jamie, let's see if you can put your director's hat on. Well, I think it's a little bit of that. Yeah. Hi, I'm directing. Um, you know, in when you're reading the book, you have an infinite number of possibilities. When you're filming, you have a budget and production time. So I think the hardest part would be choosing what is the core of this book that made people want to read it? Like, what is it about Ender's Game or Hunger Games or whatever that made people fall in love with it and made it a number one hit? And and how do I capture that when it's always going to be my interpretation because I'm the director? Well, yeah. So how do I make it it, universal? the, 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 The core of storytelling is to get to a human truth, something that speaks to your audience, something that speaks to every reader. If you're a filmmaker, something that speaks to every uh, viewer. Um, tell a human story. Tell a human truth, and it will resonate with people. And for a filmmaker, I'm 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 right there with Jamie. I think the most difficult thing of of trying to put together a film from an existing property is finding the author's truth, finding what the people who read the story saw the comic book, you know, saw the graphic novel, what did resonate? What was the truth that resonated with that audience and bringing that to the screen? Because if you're, tr- again, uh, we all agree The Shining is an amazing film. Yes. That, Here's uh, Johnny. Yeah. I mean, it's an amazing film. But uh, Stephen King said mm-hmm. it's, it's not his truth. It wasn't the truth he was telling in his story. And so we right. loved it as a film, and we loved the Stephen King source material, but the question still remains, it wasn't the same story from Kubrick's point of view and King's point of view. So that can be a difficult thing about being a filmmaker is trying to reach the same core audience. And I think that's probably true the other way around. Um, we, we've, we got a chance on the show to talk to several authors who have novelized films, and it's probably as true for them. They get a, a deeper canvas because we get unlimited pages. Like you said, the budget that we have is, look, if you keep me in coffee and Oreos, I'll keep writing. And I think, that, I, think there's, <laughs> I, I think there's also a personal investment into it because when you're reading a book, and I'll also in, include this because there's always been the, the, the faux pas, when you're playing a video game, there's a huge difference when you're playing a video game and you are immersed in the world and you are becoming part of the story than actually watching the story unfold on the, on the screen. And it also depends upon how much of the production is paying homage to the, the source material. And they're translating that onto the screen. And I know this is going to be a weird example, but hang on with me. Uh, the movie Doom. Yes, which is based upon a shooter game. That's all it is. But because you are part of the shooter and you're part of the world of Doom and seeing all these monsters and shooting them and beating up, you have a different investment than you do than watching The Rock play the character of the Sarge. And because yeah, it's, it's a much what, different experience, right? And whatever they did with that movie, the first thing out of my mouth when the whole movie was over is like, did anybody actually play the video game? Because there is nothing, with the exception of just names <laughs> and the BFG gun, there is nothing cohesive about the movie and the video game. Except at the very end where, where um, I forgot his name, the Carl Urban character at the end, where you actually do the shoot 'em up 
uh-huh. like the video game does. That was the only time that it paid homage to the source of what was going on. And I bet you it would have been a different movie if you were a character in the in the movie. And everybody I, I, looked I at do. you I like think a third they person. They did a television production a couple of years ago. Uh, the Sci-Fi Channel did this, and I thought it was an amazing idea because it was a show based on a video game where the the characters in the show and your video game play by season two would interact. They would mention things that happened. It was an online video game. So as people played, um, it changed the story. And in season two, those story changes had been made to the script so that the season changed with the oh, gameplay. It was called Defiance. Yes. And it was it – was, Fantas- the game was fantastic already, the online version, and then the fact that character interactions from the game, to- it invests your your viewers in it. And I think, again, from literature to film is the same thing, because I think you're more invested when you open a book. you Because autom- you, you know this is it's going to take you time and energy and imagination to bring this book to life in your mind. You're invested in that. Film. I'll, um, even, I'll even give you a better example. Um, M.A.S.H., I don't know if you remember the series, but there was one episode where the 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 audience became the patient. Yes, and you saw everything through the patient, uh, the the view of the uh, the patient as being the uh, the audience as being the patient and their interaction with the characters. That's the kind of thing I think a book does. That's the kind of thing I think a video game does is immerse you in the world. And if somebody else is retelling the tale and not living up to the expectation that you have for the game or the book. Then it's not going to work well with you, and it's going to it, put, it, yeah, put you on shaky ground. It, it, exactly. It, and exactly. It, and it, I think it keeps you. What do you from... think about that, Jamie? Do you think that's right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't, I don't do a lot of video games because I know if I started, I'll, I would never do anything else. But I used right. to play Tomb Raider, and you know, you really felt when when it first came out, and you really felt like you were in that world. Versus watching the movie of Laura Croft with Angelina Jolie, and it was like it was an okay movie. But if I hadn't, if I didn't know the video game, I would have thought the movie was stupid. But because I knew the video game and I was already committed to the character and the the whole thing, I enjoyed the movie. But it, it wasn't the same. Yeah, right. no, that isn't that. That's one of the things that we learn uh, as writers. We learn it like in those early days of writing and with good mentorship and good teachers, et cetera. Um, is that you never, you can never assume that your audience knows something because you know it. And right. so, I, I think what Tomb Raider is a great example uh, in our in our genre because uh, when you saw Angelina Jolie's Tomb Raider, you had really to follow that story and understand where she was coming from and, and everything, you had to have played the game or known about the game. If you hadn't, then the director made assumptions that you had. And mm-hmm. so things were out of place. Good, A good movie on the same token would have been an adaptation where they at least took a few minutes to explain to the non-gamers what was going on and why this person was and what this person was, and then for the gamers, you have to give you have to give us a little extra too because we did know that, so you wasted our time. So you have to pay that off in a way that's surprising right. and and you know that kind of thing. So I think you're absolutely right. Well, I think you bring up a good point. Um, the the filmmaker, the directors, and and the choices that they make, you still have to stay true to that core audience group because you have a following for a game or for a book, and you want to stay true to that readership. Or to the people who play. Yeah, and, and the, I think you have a responsibility as a filmmaker to, you know, stay stay true to that. Don't don't verge too much because, you know, we can be mean critics. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. We but if if you do something we love, if you if you books, comic books, games, these are things that people are passionate about. They spend a great deal of their lives immersed in a good story, whether they're comic book readers or video game players or they're uh, authors themselves. Uh, you know, and so. Um, you you have to you have to pay that up front a little bit, and then at the same time you want to the, the whole purpose is to expand your audience, is to expand you, that universe. So you want to give new people a little something that they can have too. You can't. You know who that. does that great in in real life? You know who does that great? Mm. Disney World. Absolutely. I don't know if you know about this, but obviously Disney World is the 
place that people come, they save up all year and they come and they do their family thing, right? And that's how but we put for our us kids who through live college here, in Florida. Exactly, exactly. For us who live here and we have, I have this, the um, pass holder so I can go whenever I want. Well, we just discovered that they have like a Pokemon in Disney for Disney characters and you get the cards and then it, the game changes every day and you go around the park to these special spots on the ground and a, a screen turns on inside the shop window and you can use the cards to defeat like Corella DeVille or somebody. Wow. So they have, yeah, it's awesome. So they have this like Disney quest for us, loyal, you know, we know the story but they still provide us with something new. And I think that like Disney does everything well. And that's part of like what we were just talking about with the film. You have the core people covered, but you also have something that if it's new to somebody, they can experience it as well. And you can grow in, in, inside a universe. That's a great example of mm -hmm. you know, when we all went to Disney World for the first time, even as you know, Floridians, um, we enjoyed it the same way any other visitor to our state enjoys it. We saw the things for the first time. Right. We rode the rides. But as you go over and over again and you, and you enjoy it, you pick things that you like the most or whatever. But it could be – you can shorten your day quite a bit when you just do the things that you already right. enjoyed. So you have to give us something new that feeds that craving that we have for more Disney. And that's a great example yes. of doing it in, on the park level in a film – yeah, I think you have to do the same thing. I think you have to give homage to the source material. You have to make the fans happy. And then you have to give both the fan and the newcomer that little something extra that makes them all – and at, experience. At the, at the end, they're all fans. And that's, yes. that's success, right? So um, – that's fantastic. We have spent almost an hour talking about literature to film and television, and we touched on – we did theme parks. Uh, we did just – oh, we did whole segments that weren't listed on the page over Stephen here. King. So, Stephen King. <laughs> Stephen King, do and don't. Uh, I understand, too, he also did Mickey like Mouse it. and Stephen King. Well, at least we didn't <laughs> The same show, you guys, Disney Twilight. and don't, Stephen. Don't, That's right. We, we managed to hit Stephen King this. and Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Buy that yeah, thing. in the same show. That's right. <laughs> that's that's who else does that on the World Wide Web, folks? Just the hanging with web show. Just the hanging with web show. That's right. We have Jamie Engel. We have Christian <laughs> Basil. We have myself, GW Pomacher, Sage Ia, and Dina Marie here, and we've been talking about literature to film. We hope you all have enjoyed the show. The last few minutes, we want to uh, take a, just a few minutes to uh, drop y'all some little bit teasers, where we're going to be, where we're going to find content, what we're going to be doing. Uh, but we're going to start with Jamie so that she can tell us what she's got going on first. So, Jamie, what do you got coming up? Well, you can always go to my website and scroll all the way to the bottom. Every time I put something in my calendar, it goes on my website, and that's the right angle, T-H-E-W-R-I-T-E-E-N-G-L-E.com. But I think my next, like, interesting, I have a couple of things, but my next interesting thing would be the cosmography in Coco and then the Space Coast Comic Con in September. Absolutely. We're looking forward to both of those. Those are going to be amazing times. Uh, guys, go to the right angle and check out Jamie's work. Check out uh, – she's such, she's a true entrepreneur. And, and when we define that word, it's an artist and an entrepreneur and – in addition to writing, Jamie's got some really neat crafting things that she does. She's always being creative, always being creative. And we've got some I fun like stuff. I like to do things. Yeah, she does stuff. She does some stuff. I like uh, stuff. <laughs> she loves stuff. She and uh, we've got some great things with the Hanging With Web Show in partnership <laughs> with Jamie that, that are coming up. We can't wait to announce. Those are top secret. Those are. Those are those, we've got them sealed. Top secret. Top secret, under wraps, but they're big, they're awesome, and they're coming up soon. Uh, our own Christian Basil has got some things coming up uh, down the road. Christian, what are you going to be doing? Well, I guess we, uh, I guess we can say in two weeks we're all going to be at MegaCon together. Yes, we uh, are. Megacon. Four, mega, 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 con, con, four con, con, big con. days <laughs> going from Thursday to Sunday. Mega, 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 con. Uh, and I... Mega con, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so get us get us out there at the uh, in two weeks, Thursday through Sunday. All the team, everybody. From it the is well, not quite. Show. We our LA everybody. our LA team did not was not able to travel. Oh, but, okay. But our New York crew is coming down. We're going to have all of our Florida crew together. We are going to be interviewing, interviewing, interviewing. We're going to be building content for the entire summer at Mega Con. Authors, artists, filmmakers. 
uh, musicians, musicians. We're gonna. Uh, we'll go ahead and announce it now. It's coming soon. It's under development right now. Christian and I have talked about this. Uh, the whole team here has talked. We will be announcing. Uh, we've done a lot of creative musicians in the last uh, three years of the show, and we're gonna be uh, launching the Hanging with Web Show Indie Music Spotlight uh, coming in June. Ta-da! <laughs> So that's going to be awesome. Uh, we've been collecting music from our indie musicians, and it's fantastic. Uh, that's one of the things that when we didn't make it count, we're going to go to the after party where we're going to see the Hanging with Web Show alumnus, the Kitchen Killers. And Kitchen Killers! Oh, my Lord. There she goes. And we're also, we're also going to be putting in the chair for the first time the members of the Brothers of Alien Rock. We're yes. going to put them in the chair and grill them on their descent into music and earth so that'll be fun uh lots and lots more stuff coming up guys we have to wrap it up we want to thank our partners and friends at famous Bases and funnies off the chain radio with yvonne mason our our great friends here at krypton radio our friends over at iheart radio for continuing to share this around the world wide web all of our featured authors artists musicians entertainers artists of all kinds uh they make the show possible let me me do this real quick just in case i'll throw this in here um catch me on gallifrey stands uh which is on Krypton Radio, and you can download the episodes after which uh, on Krypton Radio. Also, uh, throw this in here so you can throw it on your calendars. Uh, I have been declared a guest on Ohio Who, which is taking place in Vermilion, Ohio. Ohio Who? Ohio Who? Who? October 20th and 21st. So mark your calendars. All of you guys up there in Ohio, you're going to see the Hanging Witch. I will be representing the Hanging Witch Show, Gallifrey Stands. I'll be up there with you guys. Yeah, guys, make sure you check that out right here on Krypton Radio, Gallifrey Stands. Uh, That is your source for info and everything on everything Doctor Who. And Christian is bringing it with a great cast uh, of of other hosts there. So, guys, we're going to log off right now, but we want you to keep coming back for more. Keep logging on. Keep tuning in and see who we're hanging with next. Next. Oh. 